Hey, today we are speaking about a new topic, art and science. We are going to hear why CERN, one of the world's largest and most respected centers for scientific research, started their arts program. How artists and scientists respond to and work with each other. Why imagination and discovery are the common path for both and why we need to adopt it. All and more in this episode. We are being told to choose between the left and right brain, between studying art and engineering, between creative and analytical thinking. Our society tells us that art and business are not connected. But what if society is wrong? What if it misleading us? The good news is that understanding what art is can bring us to a new revelation. Art does matter in innovation, technology and entrepreneurship. And with the help of this podcast and its guests, You as well will learn that art is not an object. Art is a mindset. You are listening to the Artian Podcast. With me, Nir Hindi. Hey listeners, welcome back to the Artian Podcast. Today we speak to Ariane Koch, a cultural entrepreneur and a world leader in the field of science and art. She is an advisor to science labs, museums such as the Exploratorium in San Francisco, and she curates art exhibitions about technology, art and science. She also publishes books and writes about these wonderful intersections, these wonderful fields. Hey, Ariane, welcome to our podcast. Hi, Nia. Lovely to be here. Thank you, Ariane, for coming and taking the time to chat with us about your wonderful work that we are going to speak today, how you mix physics and science and art in different places around the world to drive imagination and creation. Maybe we will start with actually a short introduction to our listeners. What, who are you, Ariane? What are you doing? Uh, well, uh, my name is Ariane, and I'm really a voyager of the imagination. And I love inspiring people to create and make new things in the world, to take the world further in terms of individual societal imaginations and also ways of looking at And being and acting in the world. My background, I was a BBC staff producer for 16 years. I then was a director of the Arvon Foundation, which was a creative writing foundation which held um, residencies in four historic houses throughout the UK. And then I, through a kind of peculiar route, ended up creating a program at CERN called Arts at CERN. which was CERN's first institutional program for arts. Before you, you continue to kind of tell us uh, this about arts at CERN, I want maybe to ask you, what is CERN? CERN is the world's largest particle physics laboratory. Uh, it has over 11,000 people from at least over 120 different countries around the world working on it. There are normally about 5,000 people at CERN physically. And CERN, the building or the property, is actually spans both Switzerland and France. It's outside Geneva. And it is symbolized really by the Large Hadron Collider, which is the world's largest man-made machine. It's 27 kilometers in circumference. Wow. And it recreates the moment when the universe was born, the moment just after the universe was born, uh, 13.8 billion years ago. So for me, CERN is the most magical place on the planet, on planet Earth, because it does recreate our very few moments of existence. And I can't think of anywhere more inspiring on the planet to create an arts program. If I'm not mistaken, in 2012, they actually discovered the Higgs boson a particle. I think we have it. <laughs> you agree? Yeah. And it was one of the most exciting times ever. I mean, there were scientists queuing in lying down in sleeping bags overnight in queues in the CERN buildings, wanting to get into the main council chamber. I couldn't get in, so I watched it live with my then artist in residence, uh, Gilles Jobin, downstairs in our office. And we watched the announcement as it came out. And nobody knew 
what the announcements was going to be. And it's probably the most exciting time ever. You are in this, the largest scientific building that explored the, um, the essence of the universe and our humanity. How art connected to this place? How you came up bringing artists into this place? What is arts at CERN? Gosh, that's just about three million different questions. <laughs> you choose where to start. <laughs> yeah, where to start with that one? Well, as I said, I can't think of anywhere more exciting for artists than to go back to the moment after the universe was born and to look at the constitution of matter and the material world in which we live in. After all, when the universe was born, there was as much antimatter as matter And nobody quite understands why matter won the battle and we ended up with the material world we're in now. So artists and scientists are kind of like twin souls because they're both looking at the origins of the universe or the origins of how we feel, think, behave in our world. And I think of both artists and scientists as explorers, discoverers, people driven by curiosity to know, discover, and think, and find new knowledge and different ways of knowing. This is your perspective. And then you come to CERN. How do you actually make it happen to have a formal institution that actually bring arts into their scientific realms? I won an international prize for cultural leadership. in uh, 2009 and they said to me you can go anywhere you like in the world and I off the top of my head just decided I wanted to go to CERN because for me CERN symbolizes the very cutting edge of knowledge and technology because I love places which push the boundaries of knowledge even further also an uh, artist friend of mine called Chris Drury, who had come back from Antarctica and dropped off at CERN and created an extraordinary print, which is the heartbeat of the ice in Antarctica and the heartbeat of the Large Hadron Collider. And they both match each other. The frequencies match, match each other. So that shows you very clearly how CERN is all about discovering the secrets of nature. So... I decided to go. I had a three month scholarship. I went there for three months with no strings attached. And I actually had written to them just saying out of the blue, I want to come to you. CERN is poised at this amazing moment where you're about to switch on the Large Hadron Collider again and you're looking for the Higgs boson. Uh, physics has never been acknowledged properly as one of the great inspirations for modernism in terms of music, literature and art in the 20th century and you're just about to do something just as phenomenal as was done in the 20th century by switching on the large hadron collider again and looking for the higgs so now's the time for creating an arts program and i will come and do a study a feasibility study for setting up an arts program for you for three months funded by the uk government um so they didn't need to pay anything And I would just come and have a look. I actually sent that off to the head of communications, James Gillis. And this kind of symbolizes the beauty of CERN because literally I sent it off on a Friday and I got an, a phone call on the Monday saying, this is amazing. When can you start? This is incredible. So I flew out the following month and started my research. And then fast forward, they actually accept your proposal and they establish a formal program for the arts that actually connected from different uh, components. What are those components? That, how did you bring art into the CERN? So the feasibility study, basically, I created the framework and the program, seeing what was possible there. And uh, so when I started in 2010, I started the first element, which was the Collide International Residency Program and the Collide Swiss Residency Program. And the whole idea of the Collide Residencies was that artists would come through an open call and come to CERN for two months. Two months. Um, yeah, two months of research and discovery. And they're working closing with the scientists? Yes, so what they were going to... I always paired them with an inspiration partner. 
Okay. We refuse to call them mentors. It's a beautiful. Yeah, inspiration partner, not mentor, because pa- you're both partner. going on the same path of discovery together. And um, they were always paired. They always came a week early. So they had a week early before they came on their residency program to be plunged into the language of particle physics, which includes everything from crazy things like wimps, zillas, to antiparticles, to learning about what is a collider, how does a collider work. Um, so they always came for a week's briefing where they met at least 20, 30 different scientists. And then they come for two months uh, of immersion at CERN. But I suppose the original thing about that program which I created was I matched it very, very directly with the purpose of CERN, which is a fundamental research institution. So what I created with the artists and scientists collide program was a fundamental research program where I said very provocatively, but this was a political statement, that there was going to be no output. Now, why did I dare to do that? That can be scary that? for managers of those institutions in business as well. Everyone is looking for an output and you come and say no output. Yes, correctly. So I made my life really difficult because also that means you have, I had to fund the program. I had to find funding for the program. CERN didn't give me funding. Uh, it only funded my post. So I made my position even harder with um, funders as well. But I really believe in the beauty of discovery. And I knew that if the curation of the program was correct, if you curated the experience of the artist properly, you selected the right artists, then any and every single artist will want to create something and make something. Because CERN is so inspiring when you hear things like, The floor beneath your feet is 95% full of holes or your body is made from supernova. When you learn things like that, I, your imagination immediately gets blasted. And you learn things like your feet are older than your head because of the way the earth spins. I mean, just say those simple things and you're inspired. So I knew any artist worth their salt would create something. And every single Collide artist, all six, because I was there up until 2015, so I got the program up and running, every single artist created something. And in fact, the first, first and second artists, they won the Hermes Prize for Innovation. Um, and uh, Gilles Jobin's piece, Quantum, which was produced three years after the <laughs> game, uh, that sh- opened in Paris and in New York. You are saying so many things that, you know, I want to immediately to jump in and respond. It's like so many questions here just popping up. If I kind of take your approach, basically you say discovery for discovery's sake. We need to let our imagination just go and allow those artists and scientists that work together to go on a path into the unknown and we never know what we will discover. Yeah, I love the beauty of discovery. And it doesn't mean there aren't some constraints within there. So you have to build in constraints as well. So, for example, the artists and scientists had to give a lecture when I was running the program at the beginning and at the end of the program uh, to the public. So the public could track and understand their voyage of discovery. So they'd meet them at those first moments of excitement just before they're embarking, where they were kind of very different souls talking about their disciplines. And then you'd meet them right at the end and discover how they had interacted, how their curiosities had fired off each other. So building in that constraint actually meant the discovery was even more explosive and fueled and I do believe in freedoms and constraints but as I said I always say if you get the curation right then there will always be something there will always be an outcome which absolutely there was in the first three years yeah in 2015 you are living the CERN and since then you created the earth water sky environmental art science residency at the science gallery in Venice and And you advise uh, science labs and museums and you create exhibition at the intersection of art and science. 
I'm interested to know what attracts you, why you chose to connect art and science. I think art and science are two different ways of looking at the world. Science describes it through mathematics, through a particular methodology and process. Arts describe it through the senses, through hearing, seeing, touch and intuition, for example. They're both, though, they're both united by the imagination. And it's been trendy to say, you know, science doesn't engage with the imagination. But it does, because how else can we go further? And the imagination takes us further. And I suppose it all goes back also to my roots. So I was a Mary Shelley scholar. <laughs> so um, for my master's degree, I concentrated on Frankenstein. And Frankenstein, that incredible tiny novel by a 17-year-old girl. She wrote Frankenstein when she was 17. Yes, when she was 17. And uh, she told the story just outside Geneva on Lake Lema. So um, with Byron and Polidori, one night is the challenge of this monster, this creature which was created thanks to the latest science of that time. And for me, that really kind of symbolizes, again, the imagination and symbolizes how even a 17-year-old girl can take us further and look further beyond ourselves into really deep, intense questions about how and why we are here on the world. What does it mean? What does human being mean? What does humanity mean? And Frankenstein, the monster, after a while, you realize isn't a monster. He's a way of showing uh, what humanity is. The word monster actually comes from the Latin to show. It doesn't mean something horrific. It means, yeah, to show. And I think when you read Frankenstein, you realize, yeah, what is the essence of real humanity? The reason I ask you is that often I think we have this image of the artist is that the one that just kind of put oil or color on a canvas or just writing a song or just, I don't know, writing a book or an essay. And you actually speak about them as artists and scientists, as both explorer and discoverer of the world we are living. It's just different perspective to the same planet or that we are living in. I think you kind of describe it beautifully. And because if you, you probably know you live in the UK uh, and in the 50s, there was a famous lecture. It was in Oxford, if I'm correct, about the two cultures. And when we talked, when we prepared this uh, conversation, you spoke about how we actually need to break this concept of the two cultures and bring those scientists and artists. And I'm interested from your experiences working so many years at this intersection of art and sciences in CERN, in the Earth, Water, Sky, Environmental Residency. How do you see the influence of artists on scientists or scientists on artists? How scientists respond to those artists that suddenly coming? So again, there are many, many, <laughs> many answers in that, in that amazing observation, which has packed lots in. So I would say the two cultures are breaking down now. So that is great. And that's one of the great things about the art science movement that though the word movement and art science movement, I have to say there are many different forms of art and science. I would say there are many, many. I kind of listed about 14 when I gave a lecture last year at the Exploratorium. Wow. And then I had somebody run up to me and say, actually, I think there are another two. So two cultures is breaking down, although there will still always be a problem in terms of the hierarchy, in terms of economics, uh, because science is so much better off than the arts and humanities. So there is a kind of economic power play there, which does create a cultural difference and disconnect, which is also what I addressed with the Collide Residency Program, because I made sure that the artist was actually paid so as well as getting their subsistence, their accommodation and everything uh, paid for, they also got a salary, which was 5,000 a month, 5,000 wow. francs a month. So they got paid a salary. And I've carried that through. That's like one of my missions in life to try and break down this economic cultural difference. 
So with the Earth Water Sky Residency at Science Gallery Venice, I've done exactly the same. There's no free artists. <laughs> and that's so important to make sure that we express that artists should be as valued in our society as scientists and be on the same level of economic payment as well, as far as possible. Um, I have made that my absolute mission. What is the influences that you saw? Tell us maybe a story or two that you, how a scientist respond to those artists? I'm very interested to learn because I'm positive you have a lot of stories that scientists were surprised maybe to learn about themselves, maybe to learn about artists, maybe to get excited about things they never thought before. Gosh, yes, there are many, many stories of this, <laughs> of artists and scientists, well, the scientists getting really excited. I mean, I, last week, actually, my current Earth, Water, Sky artist in residence, uh, Emma Critchley, who I worked with last year, She's one of the world's uh, leading underwater artists that so she makes films underwater. And last week we showed to Professor Carlo Banti, who's one of the world's leading climate scientists and is the leader of the Ice Memory Project, which is creating a library of ice cores in Antarctica as a record of climate change. He was her inspiration partner. And last week, we showed a few little clips of what she's working on. So she started producing her art piece. She shot it in the world's deepest diving pool outside Padua with dancers underwater, responding to the idea of the ice core, of, of the ice cores being a body of memory, just like the human body itself is a body. And we showed them to Carlo Babanti. And yeah, both Emma and I were blown away because he literally couldn't speak when he saw the film. And then he just went, awesome. And his breath, he caught his breath, and he just couldn't believe it. And I think that was beautiful because he had no idea really what she was going to make, how she was going to respond. And his response was so extraordinary. So that kind of shows you, he really touched his soul and his heart. And I've heard that from the scientists I've worked with at CERN, for example. So James Wells, who's an extraordinary physicist, he worked with my first artist in residence on the Clyde Residency, International Residency, Julius von Bismarck. And he always said to me, the great thing about artists is they remind us that we scientists are human and they put us in touch with our humanity and the bits which when we're studying science when we're looking at things in a very linear way or a very directional way they remind us that we can look beyond even further this is one of the world's leading theorists saying that and he's somebody who does look beyond but he said it just reminds us that we're human and we're dealing with humanity uh, as well as He also said, I'm sure it's going to affect the way I theorize and discover things in the future. So watch this space. So it has many different impacts, but I think it's kind of heart, body, mind and soul. I think that's the big, big impact on the scientists, actually. And, you know, for me, kind of both artists and scientists lead with questions, not necessarily answer which go back to what you say about the discovery phase. And I wonder if there was a moment that artists pose questions to those scientists that actually make them, huh, I never thought about it that way. Yeah, I think there are many, many, many ways of doing that. I mean, like Emma talking about the body and the body, human body and the body of us. I think that really struck and resonated with Carlo, who's a great, great kind of a campaigner against cl the climate emergency. He suddenly went, he could see that link. And that was a eureka moment for him. Or the moment when Julius, I remember, sat down with the engineers of the Large Hadron Collider. Uh, that moment when Julius von Bismarck, the first artist in residence at CERN on the Collider residency, sat down with the engineers of the Large Hadron Collider and said, had you thought of doing this or that? And I just remember them being shocked at his intelligence and his understanding of how the collider worked. 
and they really seriously had to go away and think about what he was talking about. So there's so many ways that artists can surprise and challenge scientists. Again, Michael Dozer, one of the world's leading experts on antimatter, who was one of the inspiration partners and also one of the first cultural board members for Arts at CERN. I remember him always saying to me, the great thing about uh, artists is they remind you that tangents and going off at tangents is also really intriguing and to, can take you to new places instead of being totally mono direction. Yeah. Tangents can take you elsewhere as well. And artists love going on tangents. They kind of go on weird loads of tangents and then pull them all together into some kind of meaningful I don't want to say the word whole. I can, I'm resisting the word whole. It's a meaningful <laughs> being or thing or encounter or experience, which they then invite you to be part of, whether you're a viewer, a member of the audience, even a participant in. I know, for example, my current artist in residence on the Earthwater Sky Residency in Venice, Hasib Ahmed, he is working with one of the world's only uh, historians of the science of the history of wind. Yes. Wow. Yes. Yeah, it's, it's, going, it's going to be fantastic. The digital side can mean that it had to be adaptive and be digital. Uh, partly. I have a question exactly about that for the listeners that might be interested to see those projects. Are those projects available somewhere on the internet, at least to, to, to see them? Yes, there's some in, there are interviews um, on the Science Gallery of Venice uh, website. And you look under Earth, Water, Sky, for example. So what we will do is that we will add those links to the show notes. So everyone uh, that is interested in the projects that you mentioned and the artists that you mentioned can actually go and explore them. Again, before we will continue, let's take a short break. We will be right back. Would you like to work personally with Nier to develop and grow your artistic mindset? At the Artian, we work with organizations and individuals to achieve greater success. Through our art-based leadership sales and innovation training, we show organizations that there is another way of thinking and another possibility of acting. Visit us at www.theartian.com. That is T-H-E-A-R-T-I-A-N.com to learn more. So we are back with Ariane. We are talking about art and science, scientists and artists, and the interactions that they have and the influence they have on each other. And one of the things that I think is important for both art and science is creativity. And we are living in a world that everyone wants creative people. We want creative environment. We want creativity. But often we kind of limit creativity. And I want to ask you, Ariane, what can stifle creativity? How can we avoid stifling this creative uh, aspect of human? Well, I think one of the ways we can actually destroy creativity is by turning it into a product. And I, I've written an essay which is about this, saying that how creativity is like this tiger which people want to capture and cage, but actually it needs freedom to roam. It's part of nature. Nature is creative in itself, responding to situations adapting, coming up with new solutions. So I think if you want to stifle creativity and kill it, <laughs> you turn it into something which is a product. You say it has to be done within a given time in a particular way. Uh, you create a formula, you tell people to stick to it. So that's exactly what I rebelled against with the Arts at CERN program, with the Collide Residency. It was totally against being product driven. Uh, so much so that, as I said before, I said, there's no going to output. be no output. Yeah. <laughs> but that's because I knew there would be an output. But it would happen in its own time and at its own pace and in its own place. And I think in this product driven world, we are getting too hung up on checking every single stage of every single process of innovation and creativity to the point that we are actually in danger of killing it. And 
creativity is what makes us human as well, as, as is the imagination. So if we want to go further as a species, particular at, particularly at this moment when we're in the climate emergency, when we're also in something of a political emergency, we have to think beyond ourselves. What is the role of the art? The world of the arts is to connect, is to connect us all with different ways of thinking, being, and different beings in our universe. So whether it's a stone or the sky or the trees or your neighbor or somebody you don't know on the other side of the world or a new thought about gravity, it's connecting with that and giving you new ways of connecting, seeing, and being with those new things. So the arts opens a door. I think it opens a kind of magical portal, really, for humans. It's a magical portal. So if the role of the arts is actually to create this connection, what is the role of their creator, the artist himself? How do you see the artist? Not only is the connector through what they do, but in who they are. The artists, I mean, well, so many different artists, and what they have is... What, they, what probably unites them, whether they're dancers, painters, filmmakers, sculptors, is a curiosity about the world, a wish to embody their feelings and their sensations and then transmit that through their artwork and then for people to connect with that and really be inspired to have a different way of being. So artists are kind of conveners of, Of our souls <laughs> and also conveners of people and groups of people to work with them uh, to make works actually happen as well so they're kind of also they can be societal change agents where they try and change society or inspire society and individuals to change so artists are many many things they're a bit like octopus really they're highly sensitive original adaptive souls which explore and discover and go into the deep and are not afraid of going into the deep and being out of their depths as well maybe it's related to something that I have in my perception is that many artists or at least artists that I know are kind of driven by doing original works inventing new things and innovating why is it so that artists are thinking in that way that has to be original that has to challenge that to show us new path maybe because artists are just like Percy B Shelley and believed in the imagination being revolutionary and I believe in the imagination being revolutionary and changing ways of looking at things and I think many artists are believe that. So, for example, Julius von Bismarck, who was the first artist to collide, but also did a piece for me in the exhibition about physics and art, which I did at um, Bildmuseet in Sweden. He did a piece called the Lidar Helmet. It's an extraordinary helmet which allows you to see for the first time like a machine sees. Wow. And even more than that, it allows you to see through hearts. walls and floors, anything solid, by using LIDAR technology. Oh, wow. I'm always surprised about the work that they are doing. It seems to me that in your work, it's imperative to break disciplines. You're doing it between art and science, art and technology. Why do you think it's important to break disciplines, to allow them to interact? Yeah, so breaking down the disciplines, so really breaking down the boundaries of the disciplines. I really believe in crossing across disciplines. It's super important because, again, that's new ways of knowing, new ways of thinking. Innovation comes from those kind of moments. But I don't believe that it should be so broken down that you don't have expertise in different areas. I think if you ended up with fusing arts and science together and lost expertise areas, then we would be poorer for it because it's in those kind of expertise, really deep diving into, for example, antimatter <laughs> or deep diving into gravity, which is still one of the biggest mysteries there is. 
that you can learn more. And I think we should constantly think about depth of knowledge and not lose depth of knowledge by fusing stuff and making it all horizontal. We need vertical depth. <laughs> yeah. so I believe in that very strongly. I always say it when it comes to health. I don't want my doctor to be generalist. I want him to be expert in what he or she is doing. So you are also kind of breaking uh, down the barriers or creating bridges between art and technology. And now you have a new exhibition in Basel, Switzerland. What is this exhibition? Ah, oh, so the exhibition which I've co-curated with the director of HEC um, in Basel, the House of Electronic Arts, and the director of Mu Hybrid Arts Center in Eindhoven, uh, is called Real Feelings, Emotion and Technology. And it features 20 international artists responding in their very different ways to the way technology is becoming increasingly implicated into our lives. Uh, so much so that it's kind of detecting our emotions, sometimes defining our emotions, then driving our behavior. And I think certainly during the pandemic, we have seen us all literally rely on technology like we've never done before. To connect with each other emotionally and express our feelings but equally it's triggered feelings in us maybe feelings we've never had before so anyway all these kind of ideas as well as the fact for example I live in the UK so I'm obviously exercised by Brexit and Brexit is a very very clear case of how technology was used and the data from Facebook was actually you to drive the Brexit vote and drive the behavior, the voting behavior. Anyway, that's just to say there are many things about technology in the mission. Yeah, no, I mean, one of the things that you mentioned, you spoke about surveillance and you mentioned one of the works that actually kind of activate or work on the viewer the moment they enter to the exhibition and the moment they leave. Can you tell us about this work? Yeah, there's an amazing work by Lauren McCarthy and Carl McDonald called Vibe Check, where you enter the exhibition at HEC and cameras are assessing you as you enter. And you walk around the exhibition and at the end of the exhibition, it flashes up snapshots of your encounters as you've been around and analyzes them and says things like disgust, contempt, happy. So it's basically analyzed your social interactions. With the work during the exhibition. Yeah, during the exhibition. So it's great. But this is not something which is pie in the sky. So, for example, China apparently has been using this with its prisoners inside its prisons to analyze their facial expressions. So if they're not showing a facial expression of happy, uh, then they get punished. So... Um, Surveillance, surveillance of our emotions is here. Another piece in the exhibition, which is really beautiful in another way, is as, you, as we will have all felt during the pandemic, we had, no, had very little touch. You had touch with the people you were with or the animals you were in lockdown with, but nothing else. And uh, the artist Lucy McRae, who's based in Los Angeles, Wonderful artist. I love Lucy McRae. We are talking to have her on the show as well. So Yeah, Lucy is super special. Uh, we commissioned her to do a new piece. And um, she created this extraordinary inflatable kinetic sculpture called a Solitary Survival Raft, which it looks like a raft, a boat, but it's very different. You have to crawl into it. It inflates and then it deflates, and its deflated skin hugs you, so you're embraced and touched. And so it kind of is evocative of many things of being alone. Is this really survival if all that's left is you and the machine? It gives you the idea of the apocalypse at the end of the world. If it actually uh, can be a replacement. It's also the question. We always see now the robots taking care of elderly people and... It kind of raises these questions as well, at least for me. Exactly. So why are we replacing humanity with technology? 
Why? Why are we doing this? I don't know. So it's a, it's it raises question. that question, as does the exhibition. I mean, why? Why are we putting so much research? So, into so until it? when this exhibition is running? This exhibition is running until November the 15th in Switzerland, and then it transfers to Eindhoven, the Netherlands, in March. Great. So if you are a listeners that are located in Basel area, you can visit it until November 15th. And if not, check it out in Eindhoven in 2021. Ariane, we are getting into the end of our conversation, but I still have a few more questions to ask you. And I want to ask you about the book that you wrote. And you wrote a book called Entangle, Physics and the Artistic Imagination. Besides, immediately that I was intrigued by the name Physics and Artistic Imagination, I wanted to ask you, how did you get to this book and what is this book about? So I did a, I was commissioned to do an exhibition at one of the world's top Uh, museums, one of the most beautiful museums in the world, according to the Telegraph. <laughs> and it's called Build Museet, and it's in Umeå, uh, Sweden, uh, just moving towards the Arctic Circle. And they commissioned me to do an exhibition that featured, ooh, it featured 20 artists in the show, people like William Kentridge, for example, uh, Sarah Zay, uh, Julius von Bismarck, Julian Chaffier, Goshka Kruger. Extraordinary artists who all are inspired by physics and use it as a tool in their imagination and their work to just drive themselves further and further. So the book uh, came out directly out of that exhibition and it features things, for example, I created these things called diptychs where you have an artist and a scientist on opposing pages reflecting on light, what light means to them, or what matter means for them, or what gravity means, or what time means. Uh, so you have the very wonderful fashion designer, or I would call her artist, <laughs> Iris van Herpen, reflecting on what matter is and the role matter and immateriality plays in her, in her work. Yeah, so these diptychs are showing the different ways that artists and scientists look at each other. And then the book has an essay by me looking at the whole history of physics and art and how it interconnects. Um, and how, in fact, physics, in fact, artists, for example, in the 20th century, their notions of time and space, uh, which were very radical, were predated those of Einstein and general relativity. So you can see that artists have been the precursors or the prophet of things which have then been proven later. By science. Yeah. Um, the catalogue also has other essays in it, great essays by Carlo Rovelli, the amazing best-selling uh, physicist about entanglement. So he defines entanglement as a wonderful... You're mentioning so many names. I will have a lot of work in the show notes <laughs> to add all those links and all those artists' uh, names. I think it's wonderful because most of the time we don't think about art and science as connected and... When talking to you, it seems so natural that how it even possible that they are not connected. It seems to me that in every high school, we should stop telling kids, choose being a painter or being a physicist. Instead, just telling them being a physicist and being an artist is just two different ways to look at the world. And you can experiment with both. I think that's absolutely true. And I also mention all those names because you know what? In our culture, we've become too individualistic as well. And everything we do is, a, is as a result of working, and cooperating, collaborating, talking with each other. So we have to acknowledge the people we work with, the extraordinary people. So like Arts at Sun would have never, ever, ever happened uh, if it hadn't also been for the openness of the physicists, Uh, who I worked with, if it hadn't been for Rolf Hoyer, who was then Director General of CERN, if it hadn't been for Michael Dozer, who was on the board, for example. Or... So none of these things would have happened without other people. Nothing happened in a vacuum. 
And we have to realize that the universe is full of particles which interconnect and interact just as much as we as people interconnect and interact to make things happen. So you're optimistic about this merging of disciplines? I am optimistic about the way we are increasingly now understanding how interconnected we are. And this has actually come from physics. So like from the work of the theorist Karen Barad, who's really pointed out that everything from a stone to a rock, to the sky, to the sea, to a vacuum, everything is interacting with each other. And her philosophies, which are drawn directly from physics, are now leaking into culture. And we can see it so clearly within what's happening within the climate emergency at the moment. Every single action we take has an effect, and uh, for good or for ill, and we have the choice as to what we do. And what is better than working for the greater good? Um, the greater good can involve working across disciplines to come up with new solutions and understand we are all Ariane, I think it's a great message to kind of finish our conversation. We are all connected and you are leaving us with, with a deep questions about the world we are living. Ariane, I want to say big thanks for taking the time and bearing with all my questions and my enthusiasm about your work. I find it fascinating and I'm really looking forward to your future projects. Thank you very much. Thank you very, very much, Nia. It's been a great pleasure indeed. Thank you. All the very best. Follow Ariane. She's available on the Instagram. She has her own website. We will put all the links on our show notes. Stay tuned to the next episode. Thanks again for listening. We are producing our podcast without any ads and we are relaying on our community's direct support. People like you, our listeners. So if you find it valuable, I will be super grateful if you could spread the word by leaving a rating and maybe a review. It will take you just 30 seconds to do so and it is very helpful in getting these ideas to a wider audience. If you are interested to develop your artistic mindset, if you are looking to grow your business, if you want to develop the innovation competencies in your organizations, I will highly recommend you to check our workshops and trainings, all available on our website. The episode was mixed and mastered by Daniel Duran. You can subscribe to the Artian Podcast on Spotify, Apple Podcast, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. Our previous shows are available on our website, www.theartian.com slash podcast. Each episode includes show notes, guest recommendations, videos, and other materials. We can also be found on our LinkedIn page, Instagram, Facebook and Twitter, and you can reach us directly via email at podcast at theartian.com. So I will be waiting here for you in the next episode with me, Nir Hindi. Once again, thanks for listening.